our main focus at the company is materials. So think of us as a biotech company and a materials company that's looking to revolutionize the materials that make up your wardrobe, that make up your household goods, that make up your furniture and your automotive interiors. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay Ventures. On this podcast, I chat with innovators about their industries, careers, and investments. Today on the show, I have Andras Forgox. Andras is the co-founder and CEO of Modern Meadow, a company that is absolutely revolutionizing the materials industry. By using proteins as their building blocks, Andras and his team of scientists at Modern Meadow are inventing new materials that can be used in our everyday life, sneakers, bags, clothing, etc. But what's unique is they are doing it in a sustainable way. They can literally program the materials to biodegrade in a desired time frame. I'm an investor in Modern Meadow and a big, big believer in its mission. We chat about the science behind Modern Meadow's technology, the environmental impact of what they're doing, and Andras shares an incredible story involving the assassination of a family member that was a pro-democracy leader in the Soviet bloc. Andras is absolutely amazing, and so is what's happening at his company, Modern Meadow. I hope you enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Spoke. Spoke is a full-service outsourcing firm providing high-quality, low-cost solutions for all types of operational and back-office functions, including customer service, data science, HR, and supply chain management. They help companies scale their operations while keeping down their costs. If you're interested in learning more, visit gospoke.co. Andras, thanks for being on the show today. Mark, great, great to be here. So we're going to do uh, get into Modern Meadow and everything you're working on now. But before we do, I would love to kind of go through your background so people know who you are. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start and save you some embarrassment. I mean, give you some more embarrassment. But save just it kind for of, later, right? Yeah, well, I'm just going to kind of rattle off your resume, uh, which I think is going to be pretty uncomfortable for you because it's incredible. And then get into a little bit of the color, but that way you don't have to belabor all of this. So your terrible resume includes undergraduate at Harvard, Citibank, McKinsey, a Kauffman Fellow in Venture Capital, which is very prestigious. And then you started a bioprinting company, that a company that was bioprinting human organs that you took public on the NASDAQ. And now you run a company called Modern Meadow, which mm-hmm. is bioprinting cow skin, which we'll get into in a little bit to disrupt the leather market. Actually, I will correct you though. Not okay. bioprinting and not cow skin. But other than that, you're entirely correct on everything else. <laughs> oh boy. We're going to have to learn a lot today. We're going to learn a lot because I, I'm going to get all of the jargon wrong. That's for sure. So you're going to have to teach us uh, how to think and talk about the space. Perfect. Um, so uh, w- without further ado, would you mind giving an intro into Modern Meadow? Because we've done quite a bit of buildup uh, and folks listening probably don't even know what the company does yet. A little bit of illusions here and there. Uh, Would you give the overview? Sure. So Modern Meadow, we're a company that's focused on um, biofabrication, which is our core technology, to to develop materials and ingredients that can benefit the consumer, people, and the planet. And we are our our, our secret sauce in, in the form of this biofabrication is that we can work with the building blocks of nature. So we've developed the real competence around proteins, being able to design, tune, and work and and produce uh, uh, proteins in various ways that are structural proteins that we can combine uh, through our material science know-how with other other bio-based ingredients to be able to create high-performing bio-based materials. And our, our, our main focus at the company is materials. So think of us as a biotech company and a materials company that's looking to revolutionize the materials that make up your wardrobe, that make up your household goods, that make up your furniture and your automotive interiors. And what we're really focused on out of the gate is um, applications where we can feature the performance advantages of this technology, in addition to the sustainability advantages 
of this technology and the scalability uh, of it. Because you have to be able, it's all well and good to be able to innovate. If you cannot scale it and if you cannot make it accessible, then you're not going to have impact. And so this is one of our first applications. Wow, we're seeing it. This is it. This is we're, a decade in the making. A decade in the making, exactly. Um, but footwear, and I'm, for those of you listening, I'm showing Mark a shoe here. Footwear is it, one of the most challenging. It's a beautiful challenging, white sneaker. It's white footwear is one of the most sneaker. challenging applications for materials. Because think of all the abuse that you put your shoes through. Mm. So if you're looking to bring to the world, you know, new to the world materials, where it's very much driven by sustainability. I mean, our, we see ourselves as a catalyst for sustainability. Our North Star is sustainability. But we also know that consumers don't want to accept less than in the service of sustainability. We believe it shouldn't be a trade-off. You can get more sustainability and better performance, better look and feel with innovation, with real deep tech innovation. And so that's what we're focused on. By launching footwear, we can really uh, feature that, that our materials are high-performing, they're beautiful, um, they're durable, they're more sustainable, and they're not inaccessible. They can actually be accessible so they can have- And that becomes a proof point for using the materials elsewhere. Now, to, for folks listening, you're talking a little bit abstractly about materials. You're not putting the rubber sole on the bottom of the shoe. No, it's the upper. So think of us as, look, we're, we're inspired by leather, right? Um, leather was the inspiration behind the start of Modern Meadow, where we, where, where we wanted to make, use biofabrication as a technology to make animal products without the animal. Okay. And leather is this, as, as you well know, it's a ubiquitous material. We've had a long history with it. It's, it's absolutely wonderful, but, but it, it also is associated with livestock and it, it's got a lot of inefficiencies and the livestock industry is a big user of land, water, and a big emitter of greenhouse gases. So if you're looking for a material that can move you away from a dependence on livestock, well, what, what has happened over the last 40, 50 years is uh, a move to synthetics, to polymers, right? So a lot of the traditional leather industry has, um, a good amount of it has migrated to, to plastics. There's 10 times pleather. the volume. C come again? That's pleather? Where does pleather fit in this? Pleather, um, I mean, pleather generically, but there's a, a number of different brands, some which are really high end, uh, right. some which are you know, fairly commoditized. But there's 10 times the volume of synthetic materials than there are you know, uh, synthetic leather to, to traditional leather. So clearly it's, it's gained, you know, it's taken over the market share. Right. Um, but neither are great. You know, both have limitations. Um, one derives from livestock and the other derives from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking to have a real impact on positive impact on the environment and a positive impact on climate change, we have to move away from a dependence on fossil fuels on the one hand, and we have to move away from a dependence on livestock on the other hand. But ideally, we want to do that in a way where you can have the best of both worlds in terms of look and feel, in terms of performance, in terms of breathability, et cetera. And so we've created a, a material technology in the form of our biofabricated materials, the brand name of which is ZOA. That's our world of biofabricated materials. We've created a technology that allows us to really tune at the molecular level our, our, our bio ingredients, our, our proteins and our other bio-based ingredients. So we can create a whole range of properties that in some cases can, you know, be more referential to leather and in some cases can actually be quite different from leather, but can allow um, brands and designers um, and our partners to move away from, from leather and to move away from plastic. Right. So on one hand, folks out there who are producing leather have cows, methane's going to the atmosphere, greenhouse gases, global warming. The other yes. side, you've got oil being pulled out, turned into plastic, which is turned into materials and indirectly global warming and poisoning the earth. Yes. What is your product? Your product, when you say protein, so your product is made of animal tissue? No. Our product is made of proteins that can be, sor that can be uh, sourced in a number of different ways. So we can, um, we can source our proteins from plants, 
right? So the current generation of our technology is actually plant-derived proteins. Mm. We also have developed technology to be able to design and produce proteins through fermentation. So we can mm-hmm. either farm them, uh, our proteins, and, and get them from the farm and then, and then tune and modify them, or we can ferment them, uh, produce them in tanks. Uh, and then, and then to purify them and use them in our materials. But however you produce the proteins, they are our hero ingredient. And, and they're a very special category of proteins. So we've learned over the years what are the, the structure and function properties of the proteins that really makes it work in our bio, uh, we call, we call our materials bio alloy technology. We're essentially able okay. to alloy these proteins together with other bio based ingredients to create tunable properties. And so we were able to take these proteins, combine them with other, uh, other bio-based ingredients, and, and, and uh, in none of it is animal-based. So there's okay. no animals involved. So no animals there's involved. Bio- what about biodegradability? At the end of the day, people throw out the shoes or whatever yes. your material, repl- in, in whatever way it replaces leather or pleather. Yes. What, 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 what happens with this product? Why is it better for the earth? So there's three pillars to our sustainability um, principles. The, the first is, uh, we f- is climate impact. We feel an urgency to have a positive um, impact on the climate. And as, as, as we talked about, livestock is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, both in the form of CO2 and also in methane. Um, so, and, and, so, and, and, the, and the oil industry is the largest. <laughs> right. So, so if you're looking to have a positive impact on greenhouse gases and, and you're very concerned about climate change, it's not just about energy. It's not just the energy industry that you need to transition. You need to transition the materials industry as well. And so that's our first pillar. Our second, and, and, and our materials, by the way, in, in their first version, 80% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than traditional leather and wow. 25 to 30% fewer greenhouse gas emissions compared to synthetics. Wow. So that's significant and very significant at scale, and, and I anticipate will get even better over time. The second pillar is to have um, balanced ecosystem impact, right? to, to, to balance uh, the ecosystem resources. So we, don't, we want to be very responsible users of land, water, and we also don't want to um, <clears throat> use technologies that, that, that promote um, agricultural runoff. Um, you, you know, fertilizer runoff uh, right. that would lead to algal blooms or eutrophication. So those are big words, but you mean poisoning streams poisoning, and land and right, poison. essentially like having Bad stuff streams and 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 lakes have algal blooms, right? Because of too much fertilizer ends up in them. Right. So we're very mindful of how our the the, the resources and the ingredients that our technologies are based on be responsible in terms of ecosystem resources. So that's our second pillar. And then our third pillar, as you alluded to, is designing for a responsible end of life. And that Mm. end of life can be circular or it can be biodegradable. Um, It depends because, frankly, end of life is often determined by the application itself. You you, you know, just designing, you know, you need to be mindful of the entire product and what the life cycle is of the entire shoe, let's say, or handbag or furniture, and then design the material to have a, an end of life that supports the entire product. But the point is, from our standpoint, end of life is a tunable property. We can design our materials to be biodegradable. After mm. all, our building blocks are protein. And little bugs love to, you know, bacteria love to eat protein. <laughs> so, um, so we can design our materials to be biodegradable, but you also want to balance that with durability. Because the most sustainable thing you can do is to create great products that last long, so you don't have to buy new ones. And then when you're done with it, that's when it can have a very responsible end is of life. Is that always a trade-off? Be. Durability and biodegradability? Is that always? It, it can be. And that's why it's very important to be able to tune it. And mm. so for us, it's a programmable property. That's fascinating. So I, I've, when I explain this company, I tell people you're going to disrupt the entire leather market. Uh, but the, the broader narrative here is you may be disrupting a huge chunk of a broader set of materials. 
so the traditional leather market is a um it's a, it's 20 billion square feet annually and it's a 100 billion dollar raw material market synthetic leather is about the same size in terms of dollars but it's 10 times larger in terms of mm-hmm. volume mm-hmm. and together they are a fraction of the textile market which is a trillion dollar market and the fashion market is a 3 trillion dollar market right. so look i would say let's not get ahead of ourselves i would be very very happy if we become a significant percentage of the leather market or the let's say uh, synthetic leather market but as we talked about here this is not about leather this is about creating a whole new generation of um performance materials that are biofabricated that can play the role or 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 that are that can move us away from leather and move us away from synthetics from petrochemical derived synthetics so the opportunity i think ultimately is much larger than just leather now you know that you've secretly been a, a helpful advisor to me uh, as an investor because you know the synthetics market better than frankly anybody else i know you live it you've been in it for a decade uh, you know all the players how do you think strategically about the th- synthetic products market is there a segmentation you use to think about um, the types of categories. What's, what, what do you um, mean by synthetic products? Well, n- now you're getting into the jargon land that you know what I mean. So go ahead and give it the right label. Well, Let's I would that. call what we do. Um, so there is a category called synthetic biology, okay, right, which is about programming biology, treating biology as an engineerable discipline, right, and 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 being able to create a bunch of products of interest with that, molecules of interest, products of interest. What I, I would call what we do, synthetic biology is part of our toolkit, but I would call what we do biofabrication, where so we are expl- bu- building with that. biology. And yeah. I would not call what we do synthetic, okay. because we actually, we actually deal with biological ingredients, and we build biological… So uh, the synthetic companies are using ing- ingredients that replace the biological ones, whereas you are working with the base unit level units of uh, the biology that people have been consuming. We're using the, the building blocks of nature. Yeah. We're able to tune them at a molecular level to create new materials. We're not looking to imitate. We're not looking to create drop-in replacements. We're looking to create new materials with new properties using the building blocks of nature. What I would say historically what synthetics have meant is it's rep- it, it, it has really referenced the petrochemical industry. It has represent it has referenced synthetic chemistry. Okay. So when you say synthetics, typically I would think of plastics. I would think of polymers. We 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 certainly have scientists and we we know polymer science and we deal with that. Uh, but I would but but by bringing biology so centrally into the the toolkit, I would say that this is not. The same thing as synthetic chemistry. This is, or or even just you know, synthetic biology. This is really about building with biology. It's biofabrication, and 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 it's a. It, it might sound like it's a bit of a nuance, but but we do want to distinguish what we're doing here from the plastics industry, or you know from the, um, you know from just genetic engineering, because that's not that, that that's, I appreciate that. That's what, a what piece. I what, what I'd like to lump you in with for a second and have you draw lines is. The companies that consumers are aware of, yeah. the companies that are replacing products that they're used to consuming with new types of products, the beyond meat of the world. Yes. You know, there's, a, there's dozens of these. And yes. on the outside, as a simpleton, as a business guy, particularly your meat product, it fits into that bucket. Now, it's, you're making a point that it's different in that it's built on the underlying biology versus other products that are mixed and shaped to look like the product it's displacing. How do you think about that market? Are there lines in the sand of what's real, what gets segmented in or out? Are there, how, how with, with your internal lens, there must be a way or a, a vernacular you use to think about the space. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're thinking about it very sophisticatedly because you're thinking, you're trying to um, categorize how the consumer might think about it. I would simply say, at the end of the day, what really matters is the consumer experience of it, right? And 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 look in the world of materials, which is really what we're obsessive about here at Modern Meadow. 
at the end of the day, does the consumer care that we, whether we refer to ZOA as a, you know, a, a leather alternative or not? I don't think at the end of the day they care, right? They, they will care about no, knowing kind of you know, where, where it fits in, maybe for a second. But then what really matters is their experience of it. Mm-hmm. Do they think that the material is attractive? Is the material durable, comfortable, right? Does it perform in the application? Do they feel good about its impact on the environment, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, I'd love to think that consumers buy first and foremost because of the environmental impact of something, right? But while that might be a consideration, you know, most consumers won't trade off their own consumer experience for the environmental experience. But if it's, it's a gift be an or purchase, LLC equal. right? Like yeah. if I can get the, 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 the product I love, the products I love, the brands I love, and now I can feel even better about it because it's even better for the environment. Oh, and, 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 and it's at a price point where, you know, it's accessible, right? That's the real win. So I think of it much more. I think what's going to ultimately matter is the consumer centric viewpoint, which is, does the consumer love it for what it is inherently? Do they feel good about how it's made? Broader question about, about sustainability and, and the impact on, on the planet. And is it at a price point that makes sense? And, and, and that's, that's, so you're at, you know, you're asking the right question about how consumers might categorize this, but I think ultimately, you know, the product has to win as a great product, right? I have an right. electric car, um, but I love it as a car that right. just happens to be electric. It had to be a good car right? first. I agree with you. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this. Not everyone's going to have a deep science background. What can entrepreneurs do to help fix this market, to help contribute, to move mankind forward? Where should they focus? Everywhere in my industry. My industry is just emerging. Uh, so I would say everything is needed. You need um, uh, innovation. It's, it's an ecosystem that needs to mature. So there's innovation that's needed in not just the fundamental technologies, but uh, innovation needed in the supply chains, right? Allowing um, brands and uh, you know uh, manufacturers of products to be able to integrate these new technologies there's innovation needed at very much at the application level right so bear in mind we develop our zoa uh, biofabricated materials we make these rolls and uh, these these rolls of materials are different tuned differently for different applications it's a different kind of material that you need for footwear than you need for um, handbags than you need for uh, furniture. But we also need a lot of engagement um, from entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial companies and entrepreneurial brands to apply these new material innovations into products. And you learn so much from that application. I mean, it is not until we've made dozens and dozens of shoes and worn them for hundreds of thousands of steps that we really understood. Is the are our ZOA materials there for that application? And we learn mm. so much through that process. And it's a highly iterative process of going from fundamental innovation to product development to producing these uh, innovations uh, at scale to making the products that are made from these materials to then wear testing and application testing these products. And that whole cycle needs innovation at every single stage of it because no startup company can innovate everywhere in the value chain at the same time. So you need partners in the value chain. Did you always know you wanted to be an entrepreneur? You're now a serial entrepreneur officially. Mm -hmm. Um, Is this something you grew up thinking about or did the business pathway open the door and you jumped? It's a good question. I've always had a, um, a desire to be entrepreneurial, but I don't think I ever really knew I don't think I knew in the beginning what an entrepreneur was. There were not a lot of examples or role models of entrepreneurship when I was growing up. You know, I grew up, I was born in Hungary, raised in Hungary, France, came to the US, went back to Hungary. And at the time, um, the examples of entrepreneurship in the 1980s in Hungary were people like running little import export, you know, stores where they sold knickknacks and Western goods. 
So it's not that there were a lot of role models for entrepreneurship at the time. Um, but I, but I have been entrepreneurial and I have, I've, I've had a, a lot of experiences both in, in an educational setting, in university, even in, in my early, um, professional experiences to be, to be an entrepreneur within, within the confines of a large organization or in an, in right. an academic, uh, institution. So I've been an intrapreneur, I would say long before I've been an entrepreneur. So when did you come over from Hungary? What's the, uh, what age did you? Come to the States. <clears throat> I came over um, initially when I was uh, two years old. And, you know, then my parents followed me as well. I'm just kidding. They came <laughs> over. <laughs> they came over in the late 70s. And uh, I was two years old at the time. And, and I was here for three years. And then we had to go back. Uh, my father was here um, as a postdoc, uh, doing his postdoctoral work. He was a physicist. And cool. back in the late 70s, that was one of the few professions in the, in the sciences and the mathematics where there was some international movement, you know, from the mm. one side of the Iron uh, Curtain to the other. And so we were here for three years, and then we had to go back. Um, it was, um, it was uh, uh, the early 80s, and we had to go back. Um, and, and so he continued his, um, his research in physics in, in Hungary and theoretical physics at the time. And then he had an opportunity as the, the environment there was, was uh, loosening up a little bit to go to France and to do um, physics research there uh, for a couple of years on his way back to the United States. Uh, so he had always wanted to come back to the States or what was the I motivation think, for him? I think for him in the sciences, he was always keen to pursue great science and great science comes through great collaboration. Mm. And by having scientists around the world be able to, to, to work with one another. And my father was also an, a, a kind of a, an internationalist, a globalist from a fairly formative age. My grandfather was an ambassador, was a diplomat, was an ambassador. He spoke many languages. My father grew up learning many languages, having lived in a number of different uh, countries. So for him, I think it was always very attractive to be able to work and study abroad. I mean, he, he learned English. He was a translator early, you know, during his studies, he worked as, as a translator. So I think for my father, uh, science just allowed him to be able to be international as well. And that was the most, um, frankly, that was the most attractive way to have an international career um, in Hungary in the 80s, um, late 70s and 80s. That was a pretty limiting time period. Correct. Right. What do you think, in, are the things that you, when you were younger in your background that shaped you, that you can point to that set your course early, maybe before you went to college? Things that you look back on and you're like, yeah, that's when I knew I was on this path or, or put me in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I would say, uh, one, uh, being the, the, you know, the child of, of, uh, of a scientist and a doctor, my mom's a doctor, my father's a scientist. And so having that be, um, the, the, the conversation at the dinner table, having that be, um, you know, the conversation on long drives. I, I remember, having these very long car drives with my father, either on road trips or when he, you know, later on would drop me off um, at college. And what do you talk to a physicist about? But like everything, you can talk about the nature of the universe, the Big Bang, time, everything. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. And so from a very young age, I, I, I was always really curious about, about all the things that my father was doing research on. Um, and then my mom being a doctor, I mean, you know, biology is, 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 is also something I've had a lot of, of passion for. And then, so, so science being a, a big part of my upbringing was one side of it. And I would say the other really formative experience was just moving around so much when I was young, mm. uh, you know, being born in Hungary, coming to the U S at the age of two, going back to Hungary at the age of five, going to France at the age of eight at a time when not a lot of people in, in, in Hungary, at least had that opportunity to leave and come back. And so it gave me a, a different perspective. Um, it, it also made me sometimes feel like an outsider. Um, but importantly, it gave me a, an international outlook. It gave me a global, global view of things. And, and so maybe it's not completely an accident that many, many years later, I find myself drawn to global challenges, global problems. Right. And science in the service of solving those. 
that's a challenging dynamic for kids. And when I find when I've interviewed people in the past, it there's a different sp- spice, a different flavor that I, I sense from folks who were children, uh, you know, with parents in the military or whatever, any, anyone who was moving, you know, uprooted, changing friend groups. Do you think that affects you as an entrepreneur? Does that make you more independent? Is there? Definitely. I think it definitely affects you. And I think, look, at the time, there's advantages and, and, and struggles with it. Um, I mean, I, I remember perhaps one of the, the first experiences I really remember vividly was coming back from the United States to Hungary when I was five years old, because then your, your memories are, are a bit more vivid. And right. I do remember it was, I, I had a, 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 a bit of a unique perspective being in Budapest, being in you know, kindergarten, and, you know, being in, uh, sorry, first and second grade, but having had the experience of having lived in, in the US. And at the time, I have to say, I kind of felt special about it. Right. Because uh, no matter where you were in, in the world, the U.S. was idolized. You know, it was the time that the Star Wars movies were coming out and mm. American culture was just so aspirational. So I felt that I could, uh, you know, I could talk about that even as a first and second grader. And, and, and for me, that was a positive. And then when I moved to France, I, um, there too, it was, a, it was an open culture. Uh, I went to an international school. And, and there, no one was made to feel bad or different because they had a different nationality or a different cultural background. It was just a melting pot. You know, there were, right. there were, there were kids from all over. And, and that, was, that was really um, wonderful. Where I experienced culture shock uh, in a different way, where, where I, I had to struggle with it at first, was moving back to the U.S. Um, in 86 when I was in the last year of my elementary school, I think it was like fifth grade, and I moved to a um, um, upstate New York, North Country, New York, small okay. town that was a college town. And I okay. went to, you know- That was dad's job? Went, uh, went, went to, a, yeah, with my father's job, he went to Clarkson University to be a professor there. And it was a wonderful town, Potsdam, New York, but, you know, population 5,000. So after mm-hmm. living in Budapest, after living in, you know, uh, Versailles and, and, and the Paris uh, outskirts and going to, you know, an international school there. I, I went to a small college town in North Country, New York, and it was wonderful. There was a lot of, uh, you know, academic uh, resources there, great universities there, but it was much different. I mean, there were, I, I had a lot of friends in school who had not even crossed, he had not even been to Canada, even though we were half an hour away. Right, so I was definitely the international weird kid, um, and 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 that was, um, you know, that's something I think that at the time you you kind of struggle with it, but in in retrospect, I think it's also an ex- important experience to have to to just be able to feel like you're an outsider and then figure out kind of what also who you are. Positive spin on it sounds challenging as well. Sounds hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you have a, a political family. Right. I didn't know your, your father was in political service. I've had the pleasure of my, having my, your family over my to grandf- break. My grandfather, grandfather was, a, was a diplomat. My father was, tried to be as apolitical as possible by going into the sciences. Got it. Okay. Thank you for the correction. Yeah. Um, and I, I've had the pleasure of having your family over to my house to break bread a couple of years ago. Uh, right. And I believe my wife's you're... family had, had some political history, though. That's the right. point. Do you want to give us a little yeah. color on that? Yeah. So my, my wife. Is is a is a, a brilliant um, architect uh, originally from Albania, um, and she spent the first eighteen years of her life in Albania. Um, but um, um, her her family's background is that is that her her grandfather led the democratic movement um, in opposition to the dictator there, the communist dictator, and uh, he was assassinated many years ago. Um, and her father and uncle grew up in orphanages from a young age, mm. um, and they were separated. And, um, and her father was prevented from, you know, I mean, he was blacklisted from, from, from a young age because he was from this, you know, political family that, that, that was associated with the democratic movement. And Enver Hoxha, the dictator there, had to personally sign off on Adela's father being able to go to university and to medical school. 
uh. because he would have been blocked from education. But he was able to do that because he was so apolitical and so harmless and so altruistic and so into medicine that um, that it was, he was not seen as being political or threatening any any way, which is why he was able to ultimately become one of the leading doctors of Albania, one of the leading surgeons of Albania. And after um, the fall of communism and the civil war, uh, he actually became the minister of health for a brief period. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. You, to get a dictator to sign off on your education, what is the process like? You know what? I don't know the details. Went, no, yeah. you'd have to ask Adela. That's a <laughs> fantastic story. Yeah. Maybe there's um, like a, a how-to, you know, wiki page on that. I don't know. And, and ha- um, I doubt there is. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you see yourself in 10 years? You've been doing this for a while. You've uh, carved out a very important niche in this, not just the business ecosystem, but hopefully for mankind with the climate change bit. Where do you see this going? What I would say is I have no idea, but I, I can tell you the following, that the problems that we're focused on are not going to be solved in a year's time. They're not going to be solved in five years' time. And unfortunately, I don't think they're going to be solved even in 10 years' time. Climate change is not like a, you know, a 2021 problem that we're going to just resolve. It's a decade problem and frankly, a multi-decade problem. And so if as a company, we're focused on the intersection of climate change meets science-based innovation meets the scalability of business, right? All aimed at the consumer. I think that intersection is going to be a really compelling intersection even 10 years from now. So I wouldn't be surprised if I'm working on global environmental challenges or, 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 or challenges adjacent to that and working with fundamental innovation long lead time innovation um, and, and using the scalability of business to make sure that we can get to maximum impact. Last question here, Andras. You've had an incredible tra- professional training. But, sorry, Mark. But what I yeah. would just say is that Modern Meadow, we're just getting started. So it may feel like we're an eight-year-old company. Yeah. But really, after eight years, we're just getting to the starting line. I mean, it's, it's taken so much innovation for us to be able to to be able to make our, our very first generation of materials that we can bring to consumers. So I think, I think the next decade is even more exciting than the last. So yeah, well, I would. wouldn't be surprised if I'm not just in this category, but frankly, continuing to, to, to be involved in whatever shape form is best for, for Modern Meadow. Yeah, I've watched uh, a lot of entrepreneurs in the tech side go crazy, pulling their hair out, waiting for six months for an application to be developed. You've been doing it for eight years. Yeah. Plus. So a Correct. lot of patience in there. Materials take a long time. You know, the, look, the innovators in the 20th century, like the companies like Dow and DuPont, the ones who revolutionized polymers, they spent a decade and a half and yeah. a significant portion of their balance sheets developing these new innovations. We've done it in less. Right. But you have a nice moat for that. A lot of IP, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. So last question for you. Um, what is the most important thing you've learned as an entrepreneur? I always ask this question because I think um, people have garnered different experiences. And for the folks who are listening, we want to provide insight. Mm-hmm. What uh, nugget of wisdom would you want to pass on? I would say it's all about talent. You're, you know, I've been really fortunate to be able to uh, work with amazing people from day one. Um, at, at, at Modern Meadow and in other adventures. And talent is path dependent, right? So your main job as an entrepreneur is to find the very best co-founders and the very best advisors in the beginning, and then to continue to um, create opportunities that are so compelling that they attract the very best talent. And, and that then determines the trajectory of your success. And so it really is um, all about talent throughout the organization, you know, at the leadership and 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 all levels of the company, and um, and so that's one really important thing. And 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 that talent has to be, I think, it's very important to 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 bring together cognitively diverse talent. If you think about the kind of company we are at Modern Meadow, we're scientists, engineers, you know, biologists, material scientists. We've got designers. Um, We've got people who understand the world of applications. 
You've got people who understand operations and supply chain. We've got business folks. And it is the diversity of, of all of that expertise that makes it, it hum. It, and it is the fact that we all think differently and we're able to bring the best of that thinking, collective thinking for, uh, to, to the problem at hand. Uh, so multidisciplinary ways of thinking is, is, is really important. I would say that the other thing that's, that I've learned as an entrepreneur and I'm still learning is that different stages of entrepreneurship require different types of, 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 of engagement with the organization. In the beginning, when you're a kind of a zero to one entrepreneur, you can think fast and move fast. And it's all about optionality and opportunity. When you're at a, at a company that's scaling, it is really important that management and leadership not make the organization schizophrenic with all kinds of new opportunities and ideas, right? And I, as an entrepreneur, I see opportunities everywhere. So I have to not make my company's head spin because a lot of the things that we're working on have long lead times and where the development cycle can be. It's like big gears turning and yes, smaller, faster gears turning as well, but you've got to keep the, the you know, people's eye on the road ahead. Um, so, but what we can do as leaders and managers is to provide context. We can, you know, the, the metaphor that I've heard others use is as leaders, we need to, you know, we are, we, 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 we are the ones who provide context on the soil. Like we're modern meadow. We provide the soil, the fertile soil for the roots to take hold. Mm. Our managers are the ones who then inform the trunk of the tree. And our amazing scientists and engineers and designers and individual contributors are the branches and the leaves. They're the ones who are closest to the sun. They're the ones who make this tree beautiful and lush and, and, and fully come into its own. And what leadership can do is it's not my job to dictate where every leaf should go. That's a formula for failure. That's a top-down organization. And what we're trying to do a better job of is to provide enough context so that we all in the company have the same shared context so that the right level of innovation and, and ideas can happen everywhere in the organization to really make this tree bloom. And that's how we're going to make modern meadow, um, you know, fully grow into its own. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. Thank you for trying to help save our world. I appreciate that. Aw, oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks, great, buddy. Great talking to you. Be well. Big thanks to Andras for joining today. For the sake of the planet, I hope Modern Meadow continues to do amazing things and achieves its goal of inventing sustainable materials. If you like what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five-star review and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any other major podcast platform. Just search for innovation with Mark Peter Davis.